Hey everyone, uh, big news today. Today we are sharing with the, with the community our white paper for Sparklet. Uh, we are proposing that Spark, Upland's foundational utility token, would be tradable outside of Upland via a token tradability event, which is a big deal. All of this is outlined in the white paper, which we're sharing with the community and waiting for feedback and eventually a vote. So now that we're announcing and introducing the white paper, there is a big question of what is Spark, what is Sparklet, and how does this all fit together, which we're here to discuss. Upland is a layer one metaverse. We have built an ecosystem for players, entrepreneurs, creators, partners, and developers to build and expand beyond the boundaries of the platform that we're providing. So Upland as a layer one metaverse provides infrastructure, be it payment services as a platform. And we want the ecosystem partners who are currently in Upland and will come to Upland to build value, to focus on their value creation. We're utilizing Spark currently and in the future as a resource token that's required to power this value creation in form of world building, community development, user-generated content, development of games, experiences, and services. This move that we're proposing in the white paper, which is the token tradability event, will make Spark mirrored as a new ERC-20 token named Sparklet on the Ethereum network. Each Sparklet will be equivalent to uh, one thousandth of a Spark and will not affect the internal Upland economy. So this is the big news. And now we're going to dive into why, how, what we're predicting, and what are the details of the, what this is going to look like. Idan, so uh, this is a big proposal and a big change. Why now? Yeah, so maybe before kind of like we ask why now, maybe let's think about, you know, what, what is it good for, right? And, and you know, uh, Spark has been available for the past two years uh, in Upland and players have been using it, uh, you know, to, to create structures, to manufacture items. Uh, and this has provided us the opportunity, first of all, to study the Spark economy. And by now, two years after its launch, we're pretty confident that we can provide uh, kind of like the right uh, set model that is going to be sustainable for the next uh, decades to come uh, in Upland. Um, and then, uh, first of all, make again, Spark hasn't been tradable up until now in Upland. So the first and most important probably upside is that now Spark is going to be, or we plan for it to, to be truly owned by players and have them able to be traded uh, in liquid markets um, outside of Upland. So the liquidity aspect and the, the value that gives for Spark owners, that's a very um, important point. But beyond that, that also gives us new avenues for growth in Upland. So we expect that uh, a lot of new type of players are gonna discover Upland through the fact that they discover the tokens outside of Upland and then be able to convert those into uh, new players in Upland. And then lastly, uh, I think that also gives Upland, you know, especially when we are attempting to, uh, to have uh, the you know, Spark, Sparklet tradable in top tier exchanges, that will give a lot of credibility for Upland in the Web3 ecosystem. So these are all very good reasons why we want to make uh, Spark truly owned and tradable. And then the reason why now, I think, first of all, Obviously, the fact that we've been able to now study the, the token, but also the regular environment has changed in, in the US and it provides us a window of opportunity for us to do this now, this token tradability event in a way that is perfectly uh, legal and safe uh, in the US. Uh, so basically, up until now, it would have been a very difficult challenge for us uh, to, to execute this uh, token tradability event. Whereas the environment has changed back in July, so this created the, the window of opportunity for us uh, to make this move. Yeah, and you touched on a really important point that's really at the essence of the design and development of Upland, which we refer to as progressive decentralization of uh, not doing a decentralize or die at day one, zero to one, but having it as a process 
Dirk, for the people who are not familiar, can you describe progressive decentralization and how we how we use it to develop Upland? Yeah, maybe just to take a step back quickly on you know what uh, decentralization versus centralization, right? When you when you as you all know, I'm an economist, right? And you know, when you when you study that, you know, you learn actually there's always an optimum between centralization and decentralization. When everything is so decentralized, right, it's sometimes a little bit hard to to really be in, in control of everything. You know what is good for the overall ecosystem. Right. That's why you have governments, you know, to, serve, to serve, sometimes decide over things. And then you have uh, perfect um, too much centralization where actually the government decides too much. So there's actually an optimal point where you do certain things and uh, which always is actually a moving target. Having said that is also when we started out with Upland, we said, OK, well, at the beginning, we were a little bit more centralized because we were taking care of Upland as being a you know very sensitive plant. Right. And we want to make sure that, you know, there are no loopholes because when you build an economy, which is a very complex system, can have. And uh, that's why we were always very um, you know, cognizant about everything which could, could happen potentially. But we always had always the vision also to delegate more power than back to the community and to decentralize even more. And again, putting Spark on an on a, on a, on a, on a external exchange and making it tradable, that's an important you know, piece in our puzzle to, you know, to continue with the progressive decentralization of Upland. And that's you know, why you know, we're doing it now. Okay, exciting. Um, Idan, maybe let's go into a little bit, uh, what is Spark and its current utility in the Upland economy in more depth? So we understand how this affects the players and the economy in general. Yeah, so uh, the Spark on, on its very essence is uh, the way for players to create value uh, inside of Upland. It is a resource uh, that is uh, meant to, uh, you know, drive the creation, building, and powering of any non-living elements in Upland. So it could be anything, you know, between uh, structures and buildings that are being built on, on the properties. It could be map assets that are manufactured in Upland. It could be things like uh, cars uh, and racing carts. Uh, and then the energizing of these uh, cars as they either travel from city to city or participate in races, etc. And in the future, again, any creation of uh, any items inside of the uh, upper metaverse is going to be powered uh, by Spark. So you can clearly understand the importance and, and kind of like the foundational element that this uh, uh, token serves uh, for the purpose of world building and just the day to day uh, development and, and kind of like um, expansion of uh, of this metaverse uh, that is upland. Yeah, I see it as really the gas powering this entire ecosystem of creators, developers, builders, uh, community builders. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a very strong analogy of me coming from, you know, the web three world of more uh, infrastructure of layer one and layer two of blockchains of looking at Upland as a layer one and what does that mean for creators and for the rest of the ecosystem partners because if Upland saves a, gives them a platform where it saves them a lot of time with no code minting with uh, the ability to have a community for, and develop it from day from day one and it saves them a lot of it saves them a lot of steps and allows them to focus on what they're good at, and that is powered by gas, which is in Upland the energy token that is that is Spark. So, for me, it just makes a lot of sense to look at it this way, and it really brings to life the concept of a layer one metaverse for creators. Um, so, going into we're talking about Spark utility that is existing. Can we touch a little bit about a uh, future utility and what's already been planned? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so again, um, Spark utility as to date, uh, you know, it's used for construction, uh, for manufacturing, uh, and then coming uh, probably in the short time uh, roadmap uh, is going to be the utilization of Spark to power uh, transportation devices for uh, traveling and, uh, and racing. Uh, and then um, next we have uh, um, 
again, uh, uh, people may be familiar with the concept of legit NFTs. And, and up until now, legits have been exclusively produced by the Upland team. But again, we've always wanted uh, to open that uh, portion up for user generated uh, creation as well. And the way we're going to do that, it's going to work differently a bit than manufacturing, where in manufacturing and building, you need to stake Spark in order to achieve a desired outcome over, over time. So you can imagine it like workers being assigned to a task. And then when the task is complete, you get those workers back and you have the finalized uh, NFT in place. And that works for, uh, again, buildings and, uh, and, map, item, and map assets and, and cars, etc. Uh, for legits, uh, you are going to be able to spend Spark. So basically take some of the Spark that you own and, and kind of like have it work to achieve an immediate outcome in form of a legit NFTs uh, creation. Uh, so an example of, of previous legits we've had in the ecosystem, it could be things like wearables and, you know, the FIFA shirts and spotlights and stuff like that. So any 3D item that is meant for indoor use and not kind of like be manifested on the map assets, on the map, uh, on the Upland map itself. Uh, so these could be uh, created instantly by spending Spark. So it's a very important utility that's gonna come up uh, in the future. And it's gonna support basically the, the creator economy in Upland uh, for anything that is meant for indoor use. And then the last thing is that, um, uh, you know, you're going to be able to utilize Spark in order to enhance manufacturing capabilities. So you can imagine when players start to actually manufacture their own branded cars, for example, uh, in Upland, when you start out with a simple factory, you, you can imagine that you'll be able to manufacture, you know, the Toyota Corollas of the world or like very basic cars, but then you'll be able to spend, to stake Spark in order to enhance your manufacturing capabilities. And as you kind of like metaphorically stake that Spark for sort of like R&D purposes, you're better to then create better and better cars that, that kind of like manifest with their uh, racing stats, for example. So maybe you can design faster cars or cars that are more efficient in the way they utilize spark per, per mile, uh, or how they handle uh, basically turns in, 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 uh, in, in braking in races, right? So the more you stake spark, the more enhanced manufacturing capabilities you have to produce better and better items uh, that are uh, you know, specific asset classes. Uh, so that's some of the uh, upcoming uh, uh, spark uh, uh, roadmap for the future. But again, uh, if we're, Imagining like the, the future years and decades to come, right? The, the, the sky's the limit basically with what we can uh, use Spark for. And hopefully one very important thing is that we're gonna enable developers to have players stake Spark also for their third party uh, creations. And you know the things that, the, that third party developers come up with, with how to utilize Spark in that aspect Again, that is left for their imagination only. So there's a wide future of uh, you know, expanded Spark utility in Upland uh, and uh, looking forward to see how that develops as well. Dirk, there might be a lot of community members who are less into our latest numbers and maybe just give them an, an overview of the, up, the size of the Upland platform today and uh, spark ownership, et cetera. First of all, as you know, our mission is to build the world largest digital open economy. Mm -hmm. And we're on the path of, you know, achieving that. But it's going to be a part of the open metaverse, right? It's not just Upland because we're a true believer, right? That this, this whole idea about being blockchain based and enabling true ownership really empowers the user much more. The user should be much more in control. And that's why we're supporting the open metaverse also with, let's say, with the open metaverse alliance for Web3 and, uh, and many other aspects. So in terms of Upland, um, since we actually launched into, uh, well, we launched in closed beta in 2019, then in, 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 then into open beta early 2020. Since then, Upland has been developing quite nicely. We have over 3 million registered accounts so far. We have sold over 6 million NFTs. We have uh, a little bit less than 300,000 landowners. And on a daily basis, you know, we have maybe between 25 and 40,000 daily active users, which is 
which is quite a lot, you know, when you think about in the Web3 space, what, uh, you know, since it's such a such an early space where, you know, everything's uh, quite small, lit, uh, we, I think we are one of the kings out here. So we're very proud of that. I mean, we've been talking, you know, um, Spark, obviously, we also have the Apex, which, um, which has a fixed exchange rate, $1 equals 1,000 Apex. And people can buy it, you know, with, uh, with fiat currencies, you know, either in app, you know, with uh, app store purchases, or they can use, um, um, they can also use um, um, PayPal or or a credit card, also crypto to, to purchase Apex. And then they use these Apex to purchase NFTs, especially virtual properties, right? Um, to And uh, so we call that as a median of exchange. So now that we've built a strong, this strong foundation, we're proposing the token tradability event, which would create Sparklet. Idan, what is Sparklet? So Sparklet is the way uh, Spark is manifested on the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and Sparklet is, I mean, you can you can think about Sparklet to Spark like cents are to dollar. Uh, so maybe not cents because Spark is a thousandth, uh, another hundredth of, uh, of a Spark. Uh, but essentially, they are uh, a mirror of each other. So, um, ev- you know, you can imagine that every time, that, so every Spark in existence is either uh, in Upland as Spark or it becomes in, on Ethereum as a thousand Sparklets. Uh, so again, these are mirror tokens and we are going to create the, uh, the bridges that are going to enable players to take Spark from Upland and manifest it as Sparklet on Ethereum and vice versa to basically acquire or get access to Sparklet on Ethereum and then bring it into Upland in form of Spark. And you talked about bringing it into Upland in form of Spark. Uh, how is that going to work? Yeah, so, I, uh, so one uh, good example and reference to look at is uh, our NFT portal that we've launched uh, in between uh, uh, Upland and, and Ethereum. Uh, currently, it's functional for uh, uh, basically taking block explorers from within Upland and taking them out uh, to Ethereum uh, so they can be traded in places like OpenSea, for example. So the process is, is, is pretty simple. If I have Sparklet, uh, and I own it, uh, and let's say I own, uh, again, let's say I own it via uh, MetaMask uh, as my wallet. I can then go to Upland, connect uh, connect the MetaMask wallet to my Upland account, uh, and then I would be able to uh, bring in those sparklets through the bridge uh, into Upland. And when I do that, they will be manifested then as Spark uh, tokens uh, in my account in Upland. Are there any restrictions on this movement? Uh, yeah, so first of all, uh, I think the minimum uh, amount of sparklet that can be uh, brought in uh, is 10 sparklet because again, in Upland, the smallest denomination of a spark is 0. Uh, 0, uh, 0, 0.001. Uh, so uh, that is basically uh, the only restriction. So you, you need to be, obviously you need to be uh, an Uplander status and you need to be uh, in good standing. So you can't be in Alcatraz or anything like that. Uh, and so th- there are though restrictions on the other side. So if, for example, uh, I'm a player and I want some spark by, you know, treasure hunting or getting, uh, you know, my uh, daily uh, login rewards, there is going to be a constraint where I actually have to use my spark for a defined, predefined amount of time before I can take it out to be able to trade it on, on exchanges. Uh, so actually, the, 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 there are going to be some restrictions of usage of that Spark inside of Upland if that Spark has been originated in Upland before I can take it out and trade it on uh, on external exchanges. So Sparkland on Ethereum, it's actually going to be a very unique asset um, as an ERC-20 token. And looking at the other tokens out there, that there are ecosystems there, I think it's probably the only token, I dare say, that has a direct economic history of two years in a closed Web3 economy. So Uplanders have been using Spark for two years. We have all the data on chain of how it, it was utilized. I believe 
over 93.6% of players who purchased Spark utilized it in Upland and have staked it in order to build, which is phenomenal numbers. Uh, so that's, that's really unique for a token on Ethereum. I think another unique point that's worth communicating is that Spark was never sold to investors. So many times we see that different uh, tokens were pre-sold before their actual availability on exchanges at different rates to investors. Um, in Spark, we've never done that. We The only way to get Spark in Upland is either to purchase it or to earn it in the different the different mechanics we currently have today, um, whether it's level level up, treasure hunting, and other competitions and uh, ways inside of Upland, that also makes it very unique asset. I would also add that it is basically increasing distribution of an existing token and opening it up, which is a great experiment for the general industry uh, progressive decentralization. So. We have this existing token that's part of the economy, and now we're, we are opening it up and having more visibility, liquidity, and credibility within the Web3 world that uh, we are moving towards this decentralized ownership on multi-chain. So these are all very unique characteristics of Spark and would be of Sparklet that are worth mentioning. So when we're talking about Spark demand inside of Upland, who are the different ecosystem actors who need Spark and what are they going to use it for, Dirk? Yeah, so we have various actors. Um, and as you know, all of you who are listening now to, to this um, video here, is uh, first of all, the upland players, right? So they, you know, they build and develop their, their neighborhoods, right? And um, they also will be in the future, and Idan mentioned it, right, able to charge their vehicles maybe then with uh, with Spark. So that's going to be possible for the means of, of travel. So that's, first of all, the players. The second one are then the Upland entrepreneurs and creators, right? They use Spark to build shops, you know, factories, showrooms, you know, to facilitate all of, of their meta ventures, right, for what we call the player-owned businesses, right? Right, and which serve as a primary and then secondary, you know, shops or marketplaces, you know, for others to purchase stuff and, you know, to drive the whole economy. And then, of course, uh, we have the third party developers. So here we have to see what the developers are coming up in terms of in terms of ideas. Right. But uh, first of all, you know, they require Spark to establish their, you know, what we currently call dev shops. Right. Which are the constructions of the developers where players go in order to enter a third party experience. Right. And which they have, you know, the dev shops for 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 visibility reasons. And last but not least, then we have, of course, the partner and brands we're working together, right? As you know, we have a partnership with the NFLPA or with FIFA, right? Also here, you know, assets are being created and um, they require also Spark. Idan, let's dive into Sparklet tokenomics. What is the distribution looking like? How did we plan it and why? Yeah. So first of all, I think it's important to say that up until now, um, like the, that economics aspect of Spark had to do with the utility, its demand, how it's being used in Upland. We've never uh, yet put constraints upon ourselves uh, just because we needed that time to study the economy uh, it, about Sparks, right? So, so currently the current state is that Spark is unrestricted. There is no limited supply. We have put in kind of like the, the framework of how much spark we are going to inject into the economy on a, on a, on a monthly basis. Uh, but now we're at a point when we are ready to actually set uh, the rules, right, for the long-term uh, uh, you know, distribution and allocation of spark. And, and the way it works, so first of all, there is the current holders of spark, right? This is about close to 6% of the overall supply that we are, um, that we are uh, offering in this white paper. And this is a given, obviously. These are current uh, Spark holders, and and you know they are obviously fully vested, and they own the Spark, and they'll be able to actually uh, convert that Spark into Sparklet, given the constraints that we've covered uh, with with moving Spark out of out of Upland. So that's the first part. The second part is pretty technical. 
Uh, so it, these these are spark allocations that are meant for liquidity purposes. So when you trade on uh, extern on uh, exchanges, you need to you need to have uh, something called uh, a market maker. So they provide the liquidity for people who want to either sell or buy the tokens. So that's a technical part of the of the allocation. Uh, and then we get to the more interesting parts of, of, of the tokenomics. And this is the, the, the main bulk of the tokens that are allocated that are distributed between uh, three primary uh, uh, pools. The first is the upland treasury. The second, uh, and this is basically meant, uh, you know, similar to how upland has uh, managed Spark in the past. So this is a uh, spark that Aplan is going to use uh, to basically uh, keep selling spark for play for uh, players either inside of Aplan, but also in some cases outside of Aplan uh, through exchanges. And this is, you know, uh, meant for the uh, kind of like ongoing maintenance operations uh, of of the uh, of the ecosystem of Aplan. Uh, the second pool is the incentives and rewards pool. So this is spark that is used. Uh, in order to uh, um, be given out uh, for things like um, incentives like daily consecutive daily login bonuses, or maybe prizes in live events and competitions, or things like uh, treasure hunts, etc. So this is Spark that is going to be dedicated to actually uh, incentivize the engagement of players inside the Upland ecosystem. And lastly, very interesting pool is for the ecosystem and grants. So this allocation is going to be used uh, for uh, uh, basically being able to attract new types of developers and, uh, and ecosystem partners to the ecosystem so they can start uh, kind of like uh, adding their value uh, for the growth of the entire of the entire ecosystem. Uh, now, one thing very, uh, I think, very interesting that we're introducing as a concept uh, in this white paper is, again, we envision Upland to be a, a massive metaverse uh, in the future, but to plan for us to plan for that massive future requires significant token allocations. But we also, at the same time, we don't want to burden the system with an oversupply of tokens, and so we came up uh, with uh, what we uh, kind of kind of like called like a, a sustainable vesting schedule. So what that simply put means, and, and this sustainable vesting schedule is relevant for both the upland treasury and the incentives and rewards pool uh, of, of, of the allocations. Uh, what it means basically that even if we imagine the unlikely event that upland, let's say, doesn't grow in terms of usage from now on, in that unlikely scenario, the tokens are in those pools are going to vest uh, from the upland treasury perspective over a 30 year period and from the incentives and rewards uh, over a 15 year period. So this is a very, very, very long vesting schedule. But then what's interesting that happens is as the uh, ecosystem grows and we're going to measure that growth by the amount of average daily active wallets measured over a month period, right? So if today maybe that number is somewhere around 30,000 uh, daily active wallets, uh, as Upland grows, you know, from 30 to 40, from there to 50 to 100, hopefully one day to a million, that growth triggers the compression of the vesting schedule. And the thought behind it is obviously the more players that are getting into the ecosystem, the more demand there are for tokens. So the vesting schedules need to uh, to compress. So this is a very interesting model. Uh, again, uh, I think we're probably one of the first ones uh, to innovate and kind of like offer such a vesting schedule. And what it creates is alignment between uh, the availability of tokens in the liquid market and the actual growth uh, of the ecosystem. Dirk, do you want to maybe go into how we're uh, changing the distribution of Sparklet as opposed to what the Spark contracts looks now? Okay, so far, as you know, right, um, uh, Spark has always been unlimited supply. You know, we've been selling um, Spark in, in within the app, you know, during so-called Spark Weeks, and people were able to purchase it. And um, But in the future, it will not change because we're now going to have a pre-minted supply. But this is going to be a fixed number. Yeah, so how will you be able to get Spark in the future, right? So 
I mean, there will be several ways of going about it, of course. Um, we're gonna, since we're going to have it tradable on exchanges, you will be able to purchase it there. And of course, you will be able to sell it there as well. So that's the first thing. The second thing is then we continue to having rewards. As Idan explained in the tokenomics, right? There is a pool which is dedicated to, to rewards. And um, so that's where you can go and, you know, doing the daily sign-up bonus or maybe in treasure hunts or whatever we, do, we or maybe the community comes up with. You know, we will be able to obtain some spark. And then the third one is then, of course, that you can continue to purchase that within Upland. However, and um, this uh, we'll see, we will also test a few things out, right? There will be the possibility that we sell it for a discount, but, you know, then there will be some things on top of that, what you need to do in order to then uh, to bring it out to, to the external exchanges. So these are the three things we are going to offer, uh, how we're going to distribute uh, Spark in the future. However, as we all know, also sometimes, you know, Spark might be used or, you know, maybe to produce legits, you know, so this is something which is probable. And then there will be, you know, Spark moving into a pool. And we will actually have the community uh, to vote what should happen to those pools, right? But stay tuned for more details, you know, once we developed all the functionalities around that. Okay, so to summarize the big changes that we're having with is first and foremost, that we're having a fixed supply that is completely transparent and smart contracts uh, to the community. And rather than it, uh, the, the internal distribution of how Spark is either sold or given out uh, is up to the operator's discretion. Now we're having very transparent pools that uh, what is each be dedicated pools of what each one is being used for. And that is also contributing to uh, the future of um, progressive decentralization because some of those pools can then be under the control or the, gov the governance of the community itself and not only at the discretion of the operators. So all of these are really important changes that are happening right now um, that really uh, setting the foundations towards our vision and uh, implementing it with Sparklet. I mean, I'm sure for everyone in Upland who owns Spark sounds very, very exciting. Uh, li liquidity uh, being, you know, a bigger part of the Web3 community, but obviously everyone is also wanting to understand, and Idan, maybe you can shed some light, how we're going to keep the Upland economy protected. Until now, it's been a little bit of a greenhouse. We're opening it up. It comes with different risks. How are we going to mitigate those? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so again, it, I think it's something very important to understand. Also, when when people take their time to to decide whether you know uh, how they're going to vote on approving uh, this white paper. Uh, up until now, Spark has been sold on a fixed uh, on a fixed rate, uh, and now when we put it out to in, in exchanges, it's going to be opened up for outside influence in terms of its pricing. That means that the price may fluctuate up and it may fluctuate down. Uh, and and this is again this is something that comes together with all the benefits of having uh, liquidity uh, and, and open and open trade. Uh, but uh, the way that we can still protect the upland economy is by having the authority uh, to tweak the requirements for Spark inside of Upland. Uh, so, for example, up until now we have not changed uh, the requirements because it was also not necessary. For example. How long does it take to build an apartment building? Or how much spot do you need to stake uh, in order to uh, manufacture a racing car? Or in the future, how much spark will you need to spend in order to create a thousand legit items uh, that you want to that you want to produce? All these parameters can still be tweaked. Uh, and the uh, our objective at the end of the day is to make sure that the economy is still inclusive. So let's say, for example, if the if the price of the token goes up. Uh, and it becomes harder for consumers to actually obtain Spark, what we can do is lower the requirements in Upland so we can still make it accessible uh, to everybody to participate uh, in the economy and the other way uh, the other way as well. 
So by maintaining that, uh, that authority, we can have an extra layer of protection for the internal upland economy from the outside forces that may affect the price of Sparklet. Okay, so uh, opening it up obviously opens it up to macro and, and volatility, but uh, it looks like we have mechanisms in place to mitigate that for the upland economy internally to make sure that we are supporting builders, creators, and our community. Dirk, what's that upside and the potential here? So the upside is, of course, um, that since now Spark Let is going to be listed on exchanges, many more people will be able to see it. So we have a much higher visibility to, to the overall Web3 community. We increase the credibility for being listed on the exchanges, right? So because obviously big, big centralized exchanges, they have all that credibility. And also in, improves the you know, liquidity for the current Spark holders because now they are free you know, to freely trade, and buy and sell the tokens you know, uh, on the external exchanges. The other big advantages which we also currently see is, you know, that we have some, you know, we, we increase the incentive loops. What that means is actually basically now more people are exposed to Upland. They come into Upland, right? They build more you now and they talk about it, right? Or they go and maybe trade their spark again and there's more, more velocity which is being created. And so, as you can see, there's more and more activity which we can expect because for the pure fact that spark is more outside and attracts more people from, uh, from other Web3 ecosystems or fans who like what we do at Upland to join, you know, in our mission to build the, you know, the largest digital open economy. A lot to take in, Idan, what is the next step for us in the community with this regards? Yeah, so so it's next steps, right? We're, we're just at the beginning of this of this uh, journey. Uh, and again, we've taken the last couple of months to really, uh, you know, design um, the concepts of the white paper and put it down on, on paper. Uh, and now we're finally ready to reveal this uh, to our community. And the very first step is actually to get some feedback uh, from the community. Uh, we, we really want to, to listen to what uh, everybody has, has to say. Uh, and then after that feedback has been collected, we are going to offer the finalized initial version of this white paper for the community to approve. And I think it's, it's very crucial for us. Again, we don't want to try to initiate this effort uh, without gaining uh, our community's support. Uh, once hopefully that support is in place, we can then take it to the next steps. And the next steps is going to be uh, taking this white paper and working with different potential partners, like, like for example, centralized exchanges, uh, in actually trying to make this a reality. And it's important to understand that in that process, there may be additional tweaks that are going to be required uh, to, to the white paper, depending on uh, you know, the partners that we work with and the feedback that we receive from them. And hopefully after that, we will have a final execution plan. And then the next step will be actually making this whole story into a reality. Any final thoughts for the community? Yeah, so we encourage everyone, of course, to uh, you know come with feedback. Right, we have this dedicated window right now, but it doesn't mean that you know all everything is gone just after you know the initial vote, which Idan just mentioned. Right, we're in constant communication, as you all know, X One and the whole community team. So if you ever have ideas, right, feel free to drop them. I mean, we don't know if we can put everything into the white paper then, right? Because we have to at a certain point, right, we have to say, okay, this is this is it. But um, but it's so important for us to to really have the contribution of the community because together with the community we're building the world's largest digital open economy. I love to repeat that, but that's our mission, and we have to probably emphasize that. Idan, you have some more final words? Echoing exactly what you said, and and again, we are on the mission to build the world's largest open uh, econ digital economy. And we are doing it in a way, and again, we keep saying it time and again, uh, we are taking the path of progressive decentralization. And hopefully with our actions, uh, everybody in the community can see how that uh, progressive decentralization is happening step by step, you know, in a way that is maybe seems a bit slow, but it's responsible. And it's all into the effort of building a sustainable uh, economy uh, that, you know, Hopefully in the future, 
a lot of people are going to talk about it and use Upland as an example of, of how you can, you know, build huge open economies bottom up. Uh, and again, I think that's something very unique to our space. And hopefully the talking matter of a lot of future, you know, studies and, and discussions. Uh, again, like Dirk said, we I encourage everybody to weigh in uh, and, and, you know, contribute their thoughts. Uh, and we are excited to see the future with Sparklet and Spark and, and Upland in general. Okay, guys. So go into Reddit. Uh, give us your comments and feedback. Uh, we're going to publish one. We're going to have different AMAs and probably meetups in the cafe to discuss the white paper and the different uh, ways which we're looking at it, the reasoning. Hopefully this gave you a bit of a glimpse on how and why we're do we're proposing this and we're excited to do it with the community.